Decarbonizing the West Oregon Workshop. Yesterday was filled with thoughtful, engaging conversation led by a variety of subject matter experts. During roundtable one, experts in forestry and carbon markets discussed the need for strong monitoring, reporting, and verification of forest offsets. Our second panel explored pathways for biomass utilization, including low carbon energy generation through BECs and broader carbon removal applications like bio oil production for geologic storage. We also heard about utilization pathways for captured carbon, such as sustainable aviation fuel and other novel products. The day ended with a conversation where panelists shared their experiences and best practices for engaging with and supporting with tribal carbon projects. Panelists em emphasized the need to engage tribal groups in decarbonization efforts. Again, I want to thank all of our panelists and moderators who helped lead these very productive conversations yesterday. Our first panel today will explore how ecosystem resilience and conservation practices, specifically for coastal ecosystems, are vital components of natural sequestration efforts here in Oregon. These ecosystems have potential to naturally store large amounts of carbon, and increasing their ecosystem resilience can also increase their carbon sequestration capacity. Here to moderate this morning's session is Lisa Phipps, Coastal Management Program Manager for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. Lisa, all yours. Oh, it's so quiet out here. Uh, so uh, first, on behalf of the panel, I'd like to thank uh, the Western Governors Association for having us here today. Uh, coastal habitats are not really prevalent in within all of the Western coastal state and all the Western states, and so it is really exciting to have these really unique habitats acknowledged and the role that they can play in the climate conversation is really important. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our governor, Governor Kotek, and her team who are elevating climate conversations in the state and moving forward work that's already been done uh, to take us to the next level. Uh, this is a really exciting time in Oregon and around the nation as we talk about these big issues, but particularly around blue carbon, which we're going to dive into today. Um, so we have, uh, we have our panel here today. Um, I do want to acknowledge that one of our panelists uh, fell ill today, uh, like many people over the last few months, and um, is unable to make it, but she was Kathy, she is, she was, she is, <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> she is Kathy McDonald, and um, she is the chair of the Climate Action Commission for the state of Oregon, um, and we will miss her presence here today because she definitely brings a perspective that looks uh, pretty globally at this issue, but uh, we'll do our best to fill in. Uh, so I'll begin, my name's Lisa Phipps, I'm the manager of the Oregon Coastal Management Program, and we are housed in the uh, Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, and as that title suggests, it's around land use, and so it's a natural partnership that the coastal program sits within the land use agency for the state of Oregon, since land use is such an integral part of how we deal with most community issues. In the state of Oregon, we have 19 statewide planning goals that actually touch almost every facet of life. And so integrating the Coastal Management Program was natural. Uh, Oregon's Coastal Management Program was the second approved coastal management program in the country back in 1977 through the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972. We are a networked program. We have 10 state agency partners and we have 41 local jurisdictions. That makes us a little unique in the coastal management realm and that we include our cities and counties in our network, which means that their land use ordinances and comprehensive plans have the same weight as the state's enforceable policies. Um, we are housed, as I said, in the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and the department is one of the leads in taking the climate conversation forward around adaptation and mitigation, uh, which makes it, um, doubly exciting because not only do we talk about the coastal side of it, but we're also dealing with the other aspects of community resilience, and so being able to bring all those together is important. So why are we here today? We're talking about blue carbon, essentially, and uh, natural and working lands. So in Oregon, back in 2020, then Governor Brown 
uh, issued a executive order, 2004, that kickstarted the interest in creating a natural and working lands inventory for the state. And the Oregon Climate Action Commission, which was known as the Oregon Global Warming Commission at the time, was tasked with providing the governor with recommendations on that inventory. Um, the coastal management program and coastal partners have been inventorying coastal wetlands and estuaries for over 10 years. Um, specifically focusing on the coastal and marine ecological classification standards, which ended up being a key foundational piece of making it possible to include coastal wetlands within the natural and working lands conversation. So why is this important? Over the last century and a half, the West Coast has lost upwards of 80 to 90 percent of its coastal wetlands. And in Oregon, we've lost over 50 percent of our coastal wetlands and well over that when we talk specifically about one of our most special habitats, forested tidal wetlands. In some estuaries, we've lost up to 90%. In others, it's been maintained in a much more natural state, so those are certainly averages. With the interest in increasing in coastal habitats uh, as carbon sinks, which we really didn't understand for a long time, um, with the extra capacity, we created a science to policy technical team, the OCMP did. Uh, we facilitated that conversation, which includes estuary um, habitat and carbon researchers, agency land managers, agency policy makers. Um, and we learned that coastal wetlands in Oregon are currently a net sink. Uh, we also found that we have quite an opportunity to leverage these habitats as natural climate solutions. With the loss of these, historic, of these habitats historically, we can, through smart restoration, increase carbon sequestration, support estuary functions for healthy coastal economies, and also enhance community resilience against flooding, storm surges, and sea level rise. All of this work enabled blue carbon habitats to be included in the 23 legislation that formally created a natural and working lands inventory. The 23 legislation also established a natural climate solutions fund, which is an impressive piece of work once it gets implemented. And it's created with the intent to get projects on the ground, provide technical assistance to private landowners, and this is a key piece. We, all, we have a lot of opportunities on state and public lands, but it's that private land ownership that's really been difficult to tap into. This allows us to do that, and working with our coastal tribes. <coughs> OCMP is going to be working with our network partners who are recipients, and so that would be the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture who are managing these fund dollars. And we hope to find uh, opportunities to leverage these funds with the federal funds that we receive as an OCMP through NOAA via the National Coastal Management Program so that we can have an even greater impact. And so right now, we are continually refining the way we think about this very carbon-centric work and how it fits into the rest of the work we do as coastal managers. Uh, we've been managing the many benefits of coastal habitats and working to ensure we sustain coastal processes and those habitats for now 50 years. And we have an extra value now that we can talk about this ecosystem service that can be measured consistently and produce a calculated metric as we work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon. And as we move forward with our work around building climate resilient coastal communities, these efforts and partnerships are going to be key. And so now I'm going to introduce Dr. Rose Graves and let her talk a little bit about where she sits in this paradigm. Thanks, Lisa. Um, good morning. My name is Rose Graves. I'm a landscape ecologist and natural climate solutions scientist with the Nature Conservancy here in Oregon. Um, for the last five years, I've been thinking about natural and working lands in Oregon and how those can be better leveraged to sequester, store, and avoid greenhouse gas emissions. I'm here as both the Natural Climate Solutions Scientist for Oregon and also in my role as the um, technical lead for the Oregon Natural and Working Lands um, project that was commissioned by the Oregon Climate Action Commission, um, which 
brought together a bunch of technical and stakeholder folks to develop recommendations on each of the sectors within the natural and working lands to determine which practices would we recommend to be the best or the, the most highly recommended, the most that we have the highest confidence in for increasing greenhouse gas sequestration and avoiding emissions in the state of Oregon. Uh, and so I led a wonderful group of colleagues to develop the recommendations for blue carbon. And so I'm gonna get a little technical on you in the next couple of minutes, but I'm gonna keep it pretty high level just so that we all are coming into this space with a full understanding of what are we talking about when we talk about blue carbon. So blue carbon is, as you know, one of the many, many valued coastal ecosystem services. It's only one dimension of these coastal ecosystems. And then when we think about our coastal blue carbon, we wanna think about it in four different ways. The first is we wanna be able to quantify. We wanna be able to know how much carbon stock is currently in these coastal blue carbon systems. And we wanna think about how we can conserve that carbon stock. We wanna think about measuring and then thinking about how we could enhance that carbon sequestration, so bringing carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in those systems. We wanna think about measuring and reducing the existing greenhouse gas emissions from those coastal ecosystems, and I'll talk a little bit about what that might mean, but methane is the main one that we're thinking about here. And then there's a piece of this puzzle that we're still trying to understand, and that's really understanding how those how carbon goes between these ecosystems. So you can see on the slide in front of you that we have tidal wetlands, which encompasses things from tidal, um, tidal swamps, tidal forested swamps, all the way down to the mudflats. We have seagrasses and kelp, and there's tremendous exchange of carbon among these systems that we don't fully understand the, the magnitude of that yet. But what we do know is that blue carbon ecosystems have substantial carbon stocks. The graph that's in front of you shows ecosystem carbon stocks in megagrams per hectare, which is simply a way of saying how much is in one, one hectare. Um, and it's showing you seagrass systems, low marsh systems, high marsh, and tidal forests. Two big take homes from this. One, most of the carbon is in the soils in these systems and that blue carbon ecosystems along the Pacific coast, this is focused along the Pacific coast, play a really important role in climate regulation by storing through the carbon that they already store. When we look at these, the magnitude of carbon stocks on this graph, it's on par or above our coastal um, temperate forests. So when we look at a per hectare measurement for, for instance, a forest in the coast range. Um, another piece of this puzzle is that blue carbon ecosystems are pretty complex. I mentioned that we aren't quite sure how the carbon goes laterally between these different ecosystems, and they have fluctuating greenhouse gas exchanges. And that's important from a thinking about how do these fit into our state natural and working lands greenhouse gas inventories, because depending on their location and management, these blue carbon ecosystems can act as either sources or sinks. For example, I'm not gonna walk you through this in too much detail, but here's a conceptual diagram of a salt marsh. So we might think, oh, we've got a salt marsh. We can ascribe a number to it. But depending on how that salt marsh has been managed, it might still be um, sequestering and storing carbon, which you see in A, so it's reducing the amount of climate gas, the amount of climate forcing. Or if it's a drained marsh or if it's been impounded, that same marsh that's now a degraded, no longer natural system is now releasing more emissions and is actually contributing as a, climate, as a source to climate change. It has increased climate forcing towards the atmosphere. And so when we think about incorporating blue carbon into our natural and working lands inventories, we have to think about three main questions. And one of those is, which blue carbon ecosystems do you have? What's their status? And so by status, I mean, are they, in, are they healthy ecosystems? Are they degraded? What's the trend that you have in those ecosystems? And what is the extent of those ecosystems? How have they changed over time? And you wanna be able to monitor that both 
in terms of today, how have they changed from the historical past, and then also be able to monitor it going forward. And so the, um, the work that DLCD, Oregon DLCD and their colleagues have done in the inventory space has really allowed us to answer that question here in Oregon. We want to know how they're being lost, gained, and even which of them have stayed the same. And then for each of those systems, you want to understand how much greenhouse gas is sequestered or emitted by those systems. The way that works in a natural and working lands greenhouse gas inventory is that every one of these transitions among different land uses that you see on the slide there has a value in terms of losing or gaining carbon, losing or gaining methane emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, um, and so that would fit into one of those land transition categories. We're really because of the tremendous amount of investment in the research and inventorying here in Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest, we have tremendous amount of information about each of these systems within the Pacific Northwest. There's um, the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group that's led by, currently led by Chris Janicek from Oregon State University. University um, and made up of many experts throughout Oregon and Washington, they've been able to develop estimates and go out and collect the field data to be able to give us essentially the best possible estimates for these systems along the Pacific Coast. And that's a really special place to be in because a lot of states don't have that. So when we think about our, our greenhouse gas inventories, there's strength of evidence from tier one to tier three from the uh, International Panel of Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, and what you want to get to is that tier three, where you have local and regional estimates to better understand how your natural and working lands fit in with the rest of the sectors with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Because we have all of this great information in the Pacific Northwest, my job as the technical lead for the Blue Carbon Working Group for developing recommendations to the state around which practices we should do in the natural and working lands was relatively easy. Um, not without some disagreement, but relatively easy. And we were able to develop these, this list of recommended and emerging practices. And we, we thought about these from a strength of evidence perspective both in thinking about, for the recommended practices, we wanted to make sure that we had a, um, enough evidence that was point all pointing in the same direction, right? We didn't have conflicting evidence about whether or not that would be a source or a sink. And so we landed on the following three recommended practices and then acknowledged that there are some practices where we still have some study needed to better understand the role of those in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation. So because we have those tremendous carbon stocks in our existing tidal systems, we want to conserve those as much as possible. We don't want that carbon to be lost. It took a long time to get stored in that place. So tidal wetland conservation, tidal wetland restoration, as we restore those wetlands, we, we allow them to start to accrue that carbon again. Um, but it takes time. And there's still a little bit of uncertainty over how long of a time before that is truly a carbon sink. Um, seagrass conservation, so preventing the loss, the continued loss of these ecosystems. And then with emerging practices, you can see the list there. Um, and those are places that we see promise, but we aren't quite sure yet. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Liz to give us a little bit of her perspective. That was awesome. Thank you, Rose. Uh, my name is Liz Bruther. Um, hello, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I work for the Pew Charitable Trusts um, in our environment portfolio. Um, and uh, I was also able to sit on the stakeholder advisory committee that Rose uh, mentioned um, for the National Working Lands Project, um, representing um, blue carbon and coastal habitats. A little background on Pew really quickly. Um, we're a research and public policy organization that operates um, uh, as an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit dedicated to serving the public interest. And our portfolio has grown um, over time to include uh, public opinion research, arts and culture, and conservation, health, state policy issues, and consumer policy initiatives. 
Fuse Environment portfolio includes um, both U.S. and international initiatives, and uh, in this arena, we are working both in the domestic and international space. Our U.S. conservation project uh, just lost, uh, launched last summer and is focusing on advancing some common sense solutions that address the impacts of a changing climate on nature and people. Uh, and uh, we are doing that in collaboration with uh, decision makers, federal, state, and local governments, uh, tribal nations, uh, local communities, and stakeholders. Um, so I think you've heard clearly from us so far today that climate mitigation and climate adaptation are, are foundational elements of climate action to create resilience. Uh, and wetlands, um, both coastal and in the freshwater space, tick both of these boxes. In Oregon, um, and other states, part of our work has been to leverage nature to help slow climate change, specifically by protecting and restoring wetlands as a strategy that can have substantial return on investment by reducing or avoiding greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing carbon sequestration, um, like Rose was talking about. Additional work we are undertaking in Oregon includes uh, working to increase um, the resilience of coastal communities through adaptation strategies um, that include nature-based approaches like wetland restoration to handle floodwaters, reduce shoreline erosion, and capture sediment that you heard Lisa talk about. Starting back in 2021, uh, Pew recognized the potential of the natural and working land strategies um, that you've heard mentioned to improve and expand conservation and restoration of important carbon sinks, particularly wetlands. And in Oregon, we focused on uh, coastal wetlands uh, because of the data that was available due to the research of the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group over the last decade and the habitat extent um, data that the Coastal Management Program had been working on with partners as well. We noticed that coastal states embarking um, on natural and working land strategies weren't including coastal habitats, uh, largely because they didn't know the specific climate contribution provided by coastal wetlands. Uh, you heard Lisa talk about the capacity uh, Pew provided to gather experts that helped answer some fundamental questions to understand more fully uh, the opportunity that coastal wetlands presented for Oregon. Uh, Rose ran through those questions. I'm talking about um, uh, uh, the data and the extent of those habitats and the data we had relative to carbon um, values. We employed our usual approach convening and supporting research to fill the data gaps um, and uh, helping connect science to policy as, um, as we work uh, with states in this arena. The needs and the opportunities are slightly different, uh, but the fundamental data and carbon accounting that needs to occur to create an inventory, uh, which Rose explained, are relatively the same across wetland habitat types. Fundamental to making progress includes knowing where your wetlands are your carbon stocks, working to retain them and protect them, knowing where potential carbon sinks are or where wetlands could be, and restoring them. Particularly for Oregon, we recognize the biggest challenge should not necessarily be the data, um, although Rose mentioned where, where we're still not sure and where we still need more understanding, but in bringing that science to the policy work that was being undertaken in Oregon under a pretty rapid pace. I think Kathy had about um, as chair of the commission about a year to create recommendations um, to the governor's office for natural and working lands approach. So capacity issues um, were number one challenge and we were able to provide some of that support and OCMP brought together um, the experts and the agency personnel that needed to be at the table and partners. Knowledge base was another. Um, this issue is brand new to most agency staff and uh, new to us as well actually, uh, extremely technical um, and helping to bring the right researchers and consultants to the table with the agencies um, into the working group was key. And lastly, and probably um, the place where uh, I personally maybe played um, the largest role <laughs> um, on the group um, was attending the meetings, keeping track of what was happening in the policy space and, and encouraging decisions and approaches uh, with imperfect data and knowledge um, and linking um, that carbon data and that potential um, to, um, to agency operations. To, to the land use system, to land use planning. There are so many co-benefits uh, that Lisa mentioned um, um, that, uh, that, that provide to communities, um, and this is true for any wetland type, that early action would not be wasted action. So to close, <coughs> I'll offer a couple, a couple of thoughts. You heard me say, and I'm gonna say it again, 
Climate mitigation and climate adaptation are foundational elements of climate action to create resilience, and wetlands play both in these arenas. Um, they represent an incredible opportunity to help us not only sequester carbon, but to help communities uh, be safer in an uncertain future. If we rethink our relationship to wetlands and account for all of the co-benefits they provide us, we could possibly accelerate both climate mitigation goals and adaptation goals to create a resilient landscape together. And collectively, um, we are not that well set up to take full advantage of these opportunities. We're getting there. Um, we're working on it to be sure. Uh, but before the innovative thinking happens, the deals are made or the partnerships um, forged or the federal funding applied for, we need to build the convening space, the working groups, as OCMP did, um, the hubs and the collaboratives across agencies and between the private and public sector um, to uh, solicit discussions, to forward the work, um, and be ready for the next opportunity. Uh, gr uh, nonprofits, groups like Pew, can provide temporary capacity but over the long term, groups must continue functioning. Um, and there needs to be capacity for those groups to continue um, to help create lateral flow of information, resource sharing, and innovative ideas. Um, so I will, leave, I will leave my thoughts there. All right, begin questions, thank you. Great, uh, so we were given a number of questions to kind of kick off this conversation, and then we'd like to make sure we leave some time for folks in the audience to ask as well. Uh, so, we decided um, a little bit independently to wrap some of our responses to these questions in our opening remarks. So I'm gonna actually uh, rearrange our questions a little bit, if that's all right. Uh, and I'm gonna just start with, how do land use laws affect the potential for organizations to engage in coastal resilience activities? So the Department of Land Conservation Development is the um, overarching entity that looks at, that manages land use in the state of Oregon and, and, it, and it oversees the implementation of the 19 statewide planning goals that I mentioned really cover the full gamut of land use and how it interacts with communities and frankly with life in general. Um, land use is really a critical component to any kind of uh, conversations, whether it's around climate change, economic development, et cetera. And so um, in the world of coastal resilience activities, one of the challenges around land use is that it is um, static, right? So you have ordinances, they have to have clear and objective standards, they, they have to be in writing, and so they go through these really formal processes, and to change them, they go through really formal processes. And in Oregon, the local jurisdictions really are the implementers of land use. And so once plans are adopted, uh, the expectation is, is that they are implementing the 19 statewide planning goals. So a lot of the burden falls on local jurisdictions as well. And so how do you support local jurisdictions through these kind of complex conversations? How do you create nimbleness in a way that they can adapt to these, this changing data, you know, we learn more and more every day about, about climate change and in this context of blue carbon, every day is something new. And so how do you create, for example, an estuary management plan that can look at the different elements within an estuary, create a zoning structure, and then identify how land use actually happens within the estuary um, and have it be, somewhat responsive to all this changing information. Well, it's really hard. It's really hard, and it's really hard to ask local jurisdictions who have a thousand things to think about to also become experts in all of these fields. And so we've been working with local jurisdictions uh, through these kind of efforts and, and through our agency, um, just trying to get to a place where we can create some support and structure to allow organizations to build that nimbleness into their ordinances. And, and then how does that implement on the ground? Well, you've got practitioners who don't like rules um, because they stymie. We're doing, we're doing good work, so this should be really easy to do. But there are still criteria and there's still standards that need to be met. And so getting everybody to the table to understand how land use can actually be a positive force on change in the landscape that can accommodate these and build these coastal ecosystem resiliencies 
is is the challenge and something that as the any as, as the agency we've been working really hard on and through the work Climate Action Commission, through the work that Pew does, through bringing science to the table and really getting everybody um, on the same page using the same terminology is really the first step. So there are a lot of opportunities through land use to really affect some major change, but it takes time and it takes collective will and political will to, to feel comfortable moving some of these things forward. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. I can. Okay. <coughs> Uh, I think I'd um, add to first, I guess I'm championing the land use system a little bit because Oregon has opportunity <coughs> to, um, to take advantage of the carbon in all of these landscapes uh, because um, we have we managed and and worked to avoid conversion of working lands um, and of natural lands over the last 40 years. So we're set to have all these creative ideas in front of us, which, uh, which is pretty fabulous. Um, that said, there are rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, speaking in, in my past, I've worked for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and was a biologist that worked with, um, um, with counties during their master planning processes, their, la their land use planning processes, um, while they're going through their comprehensive planning. And uh, it means the most to be present at those points mm -hmm. for planners, showing maps of where carbon is situated on private lands, um, where it could be maximized where um, it might need to be retained, and particularly on the coast, um, um, as, as uh, coastal communities are dealing with sea level rise, um, looking, looking at where um, critical infrastructure needs to go, and also um, where carbon might need to go, um, and uh, where those habitats, estuary habitats need to go too, to, to continue functioning, uh, to support fishes and such. So I guess I would, I would add that as well. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, Rose? You want to help us through this one? What gaps remain in the data that uh, need to be filled in order to include additional habitats or refine the understanding we currently have about carbon and coastal ecosystems? Um, I'll try not to give the science answer if we can always use more information. Um, I think that we have a good level of information in our tidal marsh systems. So when we start thinking about the tidal swamps down to the down to the emergent marshes, we, we have a really good understanding of where the carbon stocks are. We're starting to have, there's been um, a, a really excellent push to better understand greenhouse gas emissions in restored wetlands over the last four or five years. That those that information is forthcoming. There's some some really excellent research and press right now that's um, going to help us better understand where to best place those restoration projects to minimize methane and nitrous oxide emissions from the restoration. Um, so those, those data gaps are starting to get filled. What we really need to understand are, I meant you, you may have noticed seagrasses on some of those slides. Um, seagrasses are a tricky, tricky ecosystem to wrap our heads around because they are a little bit shifty, <laughs> uh, and, and I say that with intention, right? Um, seagrasses move, they're not, um, per they don't always stay in the same place, and so having a better understanding of how to map and understand the movements of seagrasses and what that means in terms of carbon stocks is a, is a gap that we have right now. Um, we know that seagrasses trap sediments that are floating through the water and then that then contributes to burying that sediment into the ground and storing that carbon. But the extent to which that depends on carbon coming down rivers and into the seagrass or carbon from those kelp forests being trapped by the seagrass, that's still an unknown. And so there's some, some research that we need to do to better understand how that carbon moves and where those seagrasses are most resilient and able to capture that carbon. Um, I think there's, there are still questions related to um, increasing stressors on these systems and what that means in terms of continued carbon sequestration and climate mitigation as we look f towards warming climates, as we look towards um, other kinds of threats like invasive species or um, other diseases, plant diseases, and things like that. Um, uh, there, those, are, those are open questions at the moment, but I think we, we have enough data to say that our tidal wetland systems, we can proceed 
and know that we're doing good work. And then there's some some data needs in the near shore and in the marine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Liz made a comment in her uh, in her intros about the being at the table, and this next question is really about that um, because that that that's really at the heart of it. You know, getting everybody to the table, sharing food, seeing faces, putting that personal um, connection into play so that we're, we're, we're all just people sitting here talking about trying to really solve these really complex questions. And so the next question is, how can private and nonprofit organizations and state and federal agencies and uh, any others that are involved in these kind of conversations encourage and further incentivize the adoption of the practices of that some that we've been speaking to today? Um, Liz, is that something you want to start off from a little different perspective? She says no. She does not <laughs> want to start that question. It's off. just such a broad question. It's so well, big. It is. Um, can we narrow it down? So who needs to be at, th be at the table? Um, and how can we work together to implement some of these carbon storage management solutions? Um, I Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Okay. Um, I'm, I think what's been really interesting being present also through um, the coastal management programs, um, some of the meetings that you've been holding for your estuary resilience action planning, which is really digging into the community and asking questions about where are things you care about and where are the things that you worry about, um, and let's get that, let's, let's roll that together, um, is that, um, you know, it comes to light that it is all going to take all of us, right? Um, and particularly in the land steward, uh, arena, um, um, a lot of times land stewards don't get involved in the policy process, uh, yet this is so technical and so um, based on what happens in the landscape that, uh, that their voices are needed. And so creating those spaces where it can be a discussion forum but not necessarily, I don't know, t testifying or providing testimony mm -hmm. or walk getting uh, walking over that political line is, is super important. Um, I think too that um, tribal pr tribal nations um, um, can play an absolutely tremendous role um, in uh, on the coast for their ancestral territories, their priorities um, to to steward um, their lands um, and manage their lands, whether in a, a land back situation or a co managed situation or a co steward situation. You know, however that might be um, co created with them, there's tremendous opportunity there, and um, and uh, and. I think, you know, in this space, um, few convenes an awful lot. That's what we do. <laughs> um, and it's why my remarks kind of, I ended with the remarks about convening, because more than ever right now, as we're embarking on these kind of new approaches, it's going to take more conversations with more people and people we haven't talked to before. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what I'd add. Anything you want to add, Liz? Um, yeah, I'll add a couple of things. Um, one, and I'll, I'll speak from the Nature Conservancy perspective of some of the work that we've been doing in the, um, in the coast, coastal areas and in the estuaries. So um, I think that as we think about how we can incentivize the adoption of these kinds of practices, incentivize requires funding. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, um, there, there are ways to do it without funding, right? And so thinking about how do we get the updated maps, the, the information that we have incorporated into estuary management plans, that's one piece, right? And then there's the how do we fund this work? And I think that um, that is a all hands on deck, everybody to the table. How do we make the funds available so that people who do want to do conservation and restoration of these systems have, um, have opportunities to do so? And then the Nature Conservancy with um, others in the Blue Carbon Working Group have been putting together um, restoration opportunity maps for the estuaries in Oregon. And so those are, um, those are designed to help people really understand where, up, kind of further updating the maps, not just where are the estuaries, but where are the places where we could do estuary restoration and what are the actions that would re be required. And the goal there is to help that information be readily available to practitioners, both um, partners of the Nature Conservancy and other practitioners who, are, who might just want to do this work and need that extra piece of information. So it's both about the information and the funding. 
you might see us jotting notes up here. Each one of us is probably hearing something we've heard for the first time today. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's just how new all of this is. There's always something, some activity that's taking place we didn't know about, or some new initiative coming forward. So it's, this is all s really great. We want to open it up to all of you right now. If there aren't any questions, we have a few more that we can certainly dive into. But if there's anything pressing for folks that you'd like to to ask, now is a really good time. And I told one of our members in the audience he wasn't allowed to ask questions, but you can, Bill. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Bill Ryan, Department of State Lands here in Oregon. I'm just curious what the major barriers are to increasing blue carbon stocks in our estuaries. And speaking about Oregon in particular, I mean, I know there's not a ton of new development happening in our estuaries. They're pretty protected. They've been hammered by past actions. But so what are the big barriers to, to increasing carbon sequestration in there? That's a great question. Hmm. Um, <coughs> oh, would you like to start first? Well, I was just coughing a cold. So oh, I'm sorry. Do you have um, I can. I can. Okay. No, you go ahead. I'll cough back. I'll That's a gr that is a great question, Bill. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, there are, um, depending on the seat you sit in, <laughs> there are a number of barriers. Um, I think probably a private landowner um, could list some, counties could list some, restorationists could list some. There's a lot to be listed in the restoration category practitioners as far as um, environmental permitting, land use permitting, mm -hmm. um, actually um, scaling projects um, in our in-water work windows um, and making sure you can have the heavy equipment where you need it in the three months you're allowed to do it. That's huge. Um, from a really practical standpoint. I think um, uh, almost bridging back to the question that we just answered, um, incentivizing landowners, um, there's a big rub. Um, uh, you know, Oregon has really great um, special assessments on, on the books. You know, um, uh, the riparian, um, uh, riparian Lands Tax Incentive Program, the Wildlife Habitat Tax Incentive Program, um, and uh, those are incentives that are, um, that are available uh, to steward land, um, uh, traditionally for fish and wildlife habitat, but uh, can be, um, I think, there's an opportunity to um, incorporate carbon value into that, particularly in maybe that protection, the protection mode, kind of keep stocks where they're at. Um, but there's a large discussion about, um, and, and in this arena, I think there's a, a huge discussion, like we said, about trade-offs, right? So if you're incentivizing personal landowners um, through tax breaks, that also means that taxes aren't being paid to um, counties. And in Oregon, counties are rural. Um, they're already um, they're already taxed. Underfunded. Yep, <laughs> underfunded. There's one, one or three staff. <laughs> uh, and so um, um, creating that revenue, we're trying to make um, counties whole at that level. Um, we'll probably... Um, really release um, some some good opportunity, I think. Did you have any thoughts? Yes. Hey, Marie. Oh, of course, follow up. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I, I, th I think another uh, couple barriers are, one, restoration projects and estuaries are very expensive. Um, so uh, being able to really uh, quantify the value of that project as it relates to the cost of that project is really important. Um, and, and I think another, another challenge, which is also a really fantastic opportunity, is that around a number of our estuaries, is, there's also another protected landscape, which is farmland. And in Oregon, farmland is, um, is a protected resource. Um, it's limited. Uh, once you lose farmland, you don't get it back. And so we've got a lot of farming uh, lands that are around our estuaries for good reason. That's why they're there. But um, what we haven't done a really good job of in the past is looking at the, the benefits of both of those things as they work together. So restoring fringe wetlands in part of the agricultural lands that are not really used, but then there's these uh, upland benefits of improved water quality, um, better drainage, and so really talking about the the win wins of these relationships is is really important. So I, I think those are also some of the the challenges and opportunities, Bill, that that we can see. And you also don't build now more estuary, um, just like farmland. Once it's gone, it's 
kind of gone, except it, we can restore estuary a lot easier than we can restore farmland. So I think, um, I think it's really um, uh, uh, an issue of looking at what currently exists and how to start making everything work together and, and coexist in a much better place. Um, anybody else? Okay. Oh, yes, sir. One route that has uh, proven particularly challenging blue carbon has been this tapping into carbon markets, which can create a credit that has that enjoy Chesapeake Bay, has done that to some degree in um, the, the Louisiana area. Um, and I, I think we've learned basically that it's really, it's really, really regional, it's very specific to the, so I'm just wondering if the, in the Oregon blue carbon situation, if, if that's, if there's possibilities there, if it just keeps uh, being a challenge. I, I know in Washington and in the Peaches Sound area, it's, it's been more of a challenge than a, than a reality. Um, less, less certain about Oregon. Uh, I think the, your note that it's very regional is, is apt, that um, the, m the methodologies and the markets exist for both protection and for restoration of these systems. Um, but our, our understanding at this point is that it would take thousands of acres instead of hundreds of acres mm -hmm. in the Pacific Northwest to make that pencil out, mm -hmm. to make a carbon market um, really a feasible mechanism. Um, and so I think we could think creatively around how we aggregate these kinds of projects, but at this point, the carbon markets don't appear to be a feasible, viable initial funding mechanism for this work in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'll add, <coughs> and I'm, I'm dangerous in this realm, this is not my thing, um, <laughs> but uh, it building from what Rose said about aggregating, um, you know, not only maybe aggregating <coughs> carbon, you know, um, coastal carbon with forest carbon and, and getting projects put together or markets there, um, but um, across services. So we worked with Blue Forest Conservation to do um, an exploration with us on Oregon's coast uh, to figure out the feasibility of different conservation finance mechanisms. Um, <coughs> we didn't look at markets per se, but we we're still trying to look at how to, how, to, how to pencil it out, how to bring folks together to make larger scale projects occur. Um, and um, the same problem happened. It's like um, there's there's a myriad of, of land tenure um, in 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 coastal wetlands, and then also and also it's expensive, as Rose was mentioning. Um, and so they started looking at um, other ecosystem services that might be that might that might be attractive to um, different utilities or ports or corporations or wh whoever might want to go in together on on a larger project. So I'm talking about you know. Um, 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 a sediment um, sediment delivery in estuaries. Um, coastal wetlands are really good at placing, like capturing that sediment before it gets to marinas, right? Which costs ports millions of dollars to dredge mm -hmm. each year. So those kinds of services that we currently aren't uh, necessarily doing a fabulous job of of valuing, but bringing the, um, bringing players together to have a have a stake in those different services to get something done together. Any other questions? Thanks for your remarks. Um, two questions. One, have you been able to tap into bipartisan infrastructure law or Inflation Reduction Act funds to support projects or work in this space? And then secondly, the Sackett decision sort of eroded protections of wetlands um, at the federal level and states are stepping in, but I'm interested to know how you're addressing that at a state level or how you're um, protecting wetlands, which are important in the ways that you describe and uh, major <laughs> sort of protection of that has been undermined. Well, I'll tackle the first part of that question and pass off the second part of that question. The first part was around the bipartisan infrastructure law dollars and the Inflation Reduction Act dollars. And I'll speak to uh, our department. Um, we are currently through the coastal management program uh, receiving non-competitive funds for capacity building around bipartisan infrastructure law projects, so actually funding uh, restoration and acquisition projects that move uh, the dial on uh, not just climate, but just general 
improvements around ecosystem services, period. Um, and then we have uh, been successful in partnering with the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians for an acquisition project that was a competitive process that uh, was for about a 28-acre uh, uh, acquisition project at Cape Fowlweather. If you're not familiar with Oregon, you should go there. It's beautiful. Uh, but it was salt spray marsh, uh, salt spray meadow, which is just a very unique habitat. And, um, and that partnership has been fantastic. We have another project going forward through, through review right now. With the Inflation Reduction Act, Coastal Management Programs also received non-competitive funding to support anything associated with climate resilience. And we chose to bring on a staff person who's going to go into communities and actually help build climate resilience plans within that community. Um, and then we also applied for a, a recent round of um, humongous dollars uh, for a collaborative that came together to do about $35 million worth of restoration and acquisition in uh, the Tillamook and Coos counties, and that's seven estuaries. Um, and then a project that came specifically from the department that is looking to fund building a estuary collaborative that uh, brings all of the right people to the table to actually work through some of these really tough issues on a coast-wide basis and then also to update our estuary management plan so we can actually address on the ground uh, work uh, around climate resilience and other things associated with the estuary management plans, but really building in that climate piece. So yeah, we've been able to hopefully tap into some of those big dollars. Um, to the last question about the SAT decision. Well, I'm <coughs> wondering if we should actually toss it to Bill Ryan with... Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> You're really close to this issue, so thanks, Bill. Yeah. Bill's with the Department of State Lands, and he's better suited to answer this. Yeah, uh, thanks. I know I heard that question. I thought, ooh, okay. <laughs> um, so, well, here in Oregon, we have a, what's called the Removal Fill Law, so it's a, it's a state a statute that protects waters and wetlands and rivers and the territorial sea uh, from uh, dredging and excavation. It's very similar to the Clean Water Act Section 404 that the Army Corps of Engineers implements, also parts of the River and Harbors Protection Act. Um, and so in, in Oregon, really, the effect has not been that great in terms of state regulation because there are state laws that protect uh, waterways that the Sackett decision would have removed federal protections from. Also, uh, most of Oregon is covered by the Corps' Portland District, and the Portland District, um, we've been talking with them about what does this mean for how you're gonna regulate things, and, uh, and their, their opinion is, and so far it's, it's, it's um, played out this way, that most of the jurisdictional calls that, they're, that they've been making actually are not being changed by the Sackett decision mm -hmm. because they're able to establish, because especially on the west side of the state, because of the amount of precipitation that we have, that there is a surface connection to most uh, wetlands. So it's not as big a challenge, at least in the western part of the state, where most of the wetlands are and where most of the development is. Um, for in, in terms of what the SAC decision means. It does create some challenges for our water quality, uh, 401 certifications mm -hmm. that our Department of Environmental Quality does, and they're trying to figure out how to deal where, with projects where you, you don't have jurisdiction from the feds, but they still want to make sure that state water quality standards are implemented, and we're working with them to figure out how to develop processes to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Well, we have a minute and 40 seconds left and a yellow light. <laughs> um, is there anything else pressing? And we can certainly be available after if anyone just would like to talk uh, a little bit more off the cuff. But if not, um, I would like to thank Liz and Rose for joining me today. Um, uh, this was really interesting for me, as always. And um, I really appreciate, again, the opportunity for us to be here. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to these two and also to follow the Climate Action Commission. Um, a lot of good work's gonna be happening there and, um, and this is part of that conversation. So uh, Zach, I appreciate you pulling us together and um, I think we can wrap this up. Thank you. Awesome.